Ja nyt tänä, tänä se luen kuule. I'm going to speak in English now, because this lecture is in English, and I'm, I can see that there's probably hardly anyone here who doesn't understand Estonian. But let me tell you, I listened to her on Saturday, and my Estonian is kind of, you know, middle-ish for someone who hasn't grown up in Estonia. But when Marika was talking about all these health and nutrition terms and everything, I was looking at her like, huh? That was in Estonian. So today I'm going to understand every single thing she says. So, in English. We're doing it in English today. Marika Blosfeld was born in Estonia, but she moved to Germany when she was just one year old, and she grew up there, and subsequently she studied visual arts. She then moved on to New York City to explore dance and then later yoga. She studied at the Institute for Integrati Integrative Nutrition in New York and became a holistic health coach. She is also a workshop and retreat facilitator, a speaker, and an author, as you very well know now. Marika practices from her home in New York State during the cooler months, and then in the warmer months, she moves to Estonia, where she is the founder and director of the Poli Talu Arts Center. Many of you may remember Marika from the 90s when she came to Toronto with a dance performance at the University of Toronto. Or, or even, I think, maybe a Klenki Pavat, and in New York she has performed many times. More recently, however, she came to the forefront with the publication of her book, Essential Nourishment, Recipes from My Estonian Farm. This was published in English in 2011, but it was already out in Estonian in 2009 under the title Lotuslik Toit Teis Vertuslik Elu. It's a beautiful book, which Many of you are holding it in your hand already and will agree with me. It won third prize in the healthy cookbook category at the prestigious Gaumont World Cookbook Awards in Paris, France in 2012, as well as receiving a gold medal at the Living Now Book Awards in the United States. The book was also a finalist in the 2012 US Book of the Year Awards. Her cookbook has been described as visually stunning, and potentially life-changing, a cookbook and nutrition guide fusing an appreciation for the sensual pleasures of natural foods with a sensible approach to nourishment. It's my pleasure to welcome Marika Blosfeld to Tartu College and to the Estonian Studies Lecture Series. I know you'll enjoy her presentation and you'll certainly want to pre Purchase her book if you haven't done so already, especially after you've tasted some of the treats which she has prepared to go with today's tea and coffee. Balun Marika. After this beautiful introduction, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Usually I introduce myself, so I had a whole thing planned. Uh, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about my farm because uh, Kaya sort of covered the other stuff. Uh, it's always been my dream to have a place in the countryside and uh, so when in Estonia doors opened um, I had the opportunity to buy this beautiful place in Lanama near Virtsu and transform it into a center for the performing visual and healing arts. So now I spend my summers there, five months I'm there, in the winter I'm in Beacon, upstate New York and at the farm, we offer residencies to artists. We have a dance studio, we have an art studio, we have a writer's studio. So artists from all, all, over the, all over the world are welcome to come and spend creative time at my farm. And um, <clears throat> people who have come have really, really enjoyed their stay. Uh, because there's a really special atmosphere at Bolitalo. It's, it's very peaceful, very serene. Uh, there's beautiful nature around us. And uh, many people have said that being at Politalo has been a life-changing experience. And the nice thing is that we feed them well. <laughs> so they really don't have to worry about anything. They can just focus 100% on their creative work. And that's a real gift, as any artist would know who does this on a daily basis. And um, my uh, path to nutrition also came through this farm because uh, once we had done the major restoration, we're still kind of doing little things here and there, um, and we started to um, 
offer workshops, uh, it became clear that I have to feed my people. And, uh, oops. <laughs> and um, at first I would just do this according to my gut feeling, which actually is not a bad thing at all because even the uh, scientists now have discovered that we have a second gut, a second brain in the gut. Uh, that's where expressions like gut feeling come from, you know, that we do have a source of intelligence and intuition in our belly. Uh, but after a couple of years, I figured it might be helpful to get a little bit of education in the field of nutrition so that I can really be sure that I offer my guests well-balanced and nutritious meals. Okay, um, and maybe just briefly about my food philosophy, uh, which is really very simple, and I don't believe that eating healthy or eating well has to be complicated. I believe that eating as close as possible to Mother Nature is the way to go. Eating whole foods, meaning foods where nothing has been taken away, nothing has been added to it, uh, I also believe that these foods, which would be, you know, your vegetables, your grains, your leafy greens, your uh, legumes, your fruits, berries, mushrooms, lettuces, seeds, uh, nuts, and also the animal products, meat, uh, poultry, fish, eggs, and milk. Uh, I believe that these foods, not only do they have all the vitamins and all the minerals what we need, but I also believe that they have the most life force and vitality and energy. And while this is maybe something that science cannot quite measure yet, you feel it. You feel the difference whether you eat a carrot that comes right from your garden that you just picked half an hour before you eat it, or you eat some packaged food that you buy in the supermarket. There's a huge difference in how you feel. Now, I have the feeling that everybody's looking at the slides and nobody's paying attention to me. Is that true? No? Okay. So then we'll let them run. They'll repeat itself. Maybe you'll get bored after a while and then you look at me. All right. So today I'm going to present with you, to you, seven principles for energizing body and mind by making smart food choices. The state of your energy level, productivity, and mental capacity has a lot to do with what and how you feed your bodies. Choosing the right foods will make you thrive. Choosing the wrong foods will bring you down. Eating habits can either support your body's absorption of nutrients, or shut down the entire digestive process. Have you ever experienced that when you have a breakfast that is high in uh, processed carbohydrates like a boxed cereal or a muffin or a bagel, that about mid-morning you feel completely drained of energy, you feel moody, unmotivated, and unfocused? Or do you skip breakfast altogether and just fuel up with caffeinated drinks which leave your nervous system wired and on edge but not really charged and with grounded energy to really tackle the day's challenges? Do you eat lunch while sitting at your desk working, not really paying attention to what you put in your mouth and then after a little while feeling a little sluggish? Do you experience a dip in energy in the afternoon that you try to fix with a sweet treat or some coffee, only to find yourself having a second dip in energy just about an hour later? Have you ever experienced that when you have an important meeting to attend or you have to give a presentation in front of a bunch of people, that you don't feel assertive enough, that your brain draws blanks and you can't really focus on the important task at hand. Let's look at how different sources of energy perform in your body and what role hydration plays and how the absorption of nutrients affects what's really going on in our bodies and brain.
So the first principle is balancing your blood sugar level. To keep your brain and body fueled, you need a steady stream of small amounts of sugar. I'm going to repeat this. In order to keep your brain and body fueled, you need a steady amount of small amounts of sugar, a steady stream of small amounts of sugar. And in order for that to happen, you need to consciously balance your blood sugar level. And that is determined by the kinds of carbohydrates you eat. Let's look at this more closely. There are two kinds of carbohydrates, simple and complex. Simple carbs are made up of one or two sugar molecules. For example, white sugar is made up of one molecule glucose and one molecule fructose. Complex carbs are made up of many sugar molecules. They're long chains of sugar molecules and they are wrapped up in the fiber of the food. Fiber too is a complex carbohydrate, but one that, that does not get digested. So it does not affect our blood sugar directly. Now simple carbs or sugars, as we call them in common parlance, break down quickly. When you eat sugary foods, your blood sugar level spikes. And because your blood sugar level went up so high and so suddenly, your body recognizes this as an emergency. It is in fact dangerous to have too much sugar in your blood. In extreme cases, this can lead to a coma. Now don't be afraid, it's probably not gonna happen to you, but this can happen and does happen to people who are diabetic and don't get their insulin shot in time. So because your blood sugar level went up so high and so suddenly, your body will then, in order to save the situation, produce a lot of insulin. It will overcompensate. And what happens then is that that high blood sugar level will suddenly drop and way below the middle ground. And you find yourself with blood sugar levels that are too low. And how do you feel then? How do you feel when your blood sugar level is too low? Tired, yes, you can't focus, you don't have energy, and so on. And what does your body crave then? Sugar, and is that wrong? Kind of yes and no, right? So you see how sugar in a weird way is both the problem and also the solution. However, if you then give in and have again another sugary snack, the whole thing repeats itself. Your blood sugar level goes way up, you make a lot of insulin, it goes way down. You want sugar again. And this way, you literally can go up and down and up and down all day long, and you never come to that comfortable middle ground where your blood sugar level is leveled and balanced. So just to make sure that we know what we're here talk talking about, could you name a few foods that are high in sugar? Yes, especially milk chocolate. What else? Donuts. Okay, very good. You get the idea. What else? Pop and juices, yes. All flavored, you know, yogurts, milk products, uh, all cookies, candies, um, cakes, pastries. Okay, these are all high in sugar. Excellent. Now, with the complex carbohydrates, it's a totally different story. Um, because they are long molecules and entangled in the fiber of the food, it takes the body much longer to break, first untangle them, and then to break them down into their building blocks, which are the simple sugars. So that means that the sugar from the complex carbohydrates trickles into the blood gradually. 
And that's a beautiful thing because it will not produce any sugar peaks or sugar lows. It will give us that constant stream of small amounts of sugars. And it would also give us energy for many hours. We will not be hungry for many hours and we will not be craving sugar for many hours. So that's the beauty of complex carbohydrates. Now, what foods give us those amazing complex carbohydrates? Peas and beans, yes, all the legumes, exactly, and lentils as well. What else? Fruit. No. No, fruits have a lot of simple sugars, fructose, right? It's not a complex. Yes, root vegetables and all vegetables, really, all vegetables. And then one third group. Whole grains, yes. Whole intact grains, exactly. So those are the three groups of foods that provide us with those amazing complex carbohydrates. And um, I know many people still count calories, uh, especially when it comes to weight loss, which I consider not such a useful thing to do because it's really not about the number, but it's about where the calories come from, from what food. So I'm gonna give you a good example for that. Let's say 200 calories, right? If you eat it in, a, in the form of a cake, you know already what happen, happens. Your blood sugar level will shoot up, you make a lot of insulin, it will shoot down, and poof, the energy is gone in a relatively short time. But all that excess sugar has turned into fat. So you have added a little more fat to your body fat. Now, if you eat the 200 calories in the form of a whole grain, a legume, or a vegetable, then it takes the body longer to untangle the fiber and break down the complex carbohydrates into sugars, which means sugar trickles gradually in your blood, which means you do not crave sugar, you are not hungry, you ha have even energy, you have even moods, and you do not put on any weight. So you see, it doesn't really matter what the number is, but really it matters what food you eat. Now, sugar is really an empty food. It's like this concentrated thing of just one item, which you do not find in nature anywhere. In nature, there are always many components making up a food or whatever, right? So already in that sense, sugar is really too concentrated for our bodies to handle. And that's also why it just kind of throws off the balance. It's like eating the chemical sugar. Um, Furthermore, sugar has no nutrients except for, you know, the empty calories. So it has no vitamins, no minerals, no enzyme, no antioxidants, nothing. However, in order for our body to digest the sugar, it needs to then dip into its own mineral reserves because sugar doesn't provide any. And on top of that, sugar leads to the excretion of B vitamins and most minerals. So you can see how a diet that's high in sugar eventually will lead to a complete depletion of your body. And that then sets the stage for all kinds of illnesses. And that's the reason why sugar is not just associated with diabetes, but with hundreds of illnesses. Now, white flour is also an empty food. Why? Exactly. Exactly. So, it all starts with the wheat kernel, right? Or wheat berry, it's called. Uh, but then the outer layer gets removed. And with the wheat kernel, it happens to be that all the valuable stuff is in the outer layer. So that's where you have your fiber, that's where you have your vitamin, vitamins and minerals and also healthy oils. So that gets removed and then you're left with the starchy part. And so in that sense, it's, it's very low in nutrients. 
But not only that, this starchy part then gets ground into a very, very fine powder, which flour is, right? I mean, flour, the particles of flour are so small that you cannot see them with your naked eye. So when you then eat white flour products, the little parts have a relatively large surface area, and that means that it's very easy for our digestive juices to break down the starch into the simple carbohydrates or sugars. And in that way, white flour behaves in our body just like white sugar. Both are empty, but both also will lead to ups and downs in our energy level, ups and downs in our moods, and will lead to weight gain, and eventually to the depletion of the body. Uh, since we're talking about sugar, I also want to briefly talk about corn syrup. Um, and um, corn syrup is even more dangerous to the body than white sugar, if you can believe that. Compared to sugar, I mean, sugar almost looks innocent compared to corn syrup. So what it is, is that um, it's a highly processed sweetener. And while the no name sounds kind of innocent, well, it's made from corn, it's all natural, what can be so bad about it? The end product has very little to do with the corn. Uh, it's completely artificially altered uh, and then it's turned into glucose syrup and then part of the glucose is then turned into fructose to make it more sugar-like because sugar is sort of 50-50 and then uh, high, corn, high fructose corn syrup tries to have the same sweetness as white sugar. Anyway, uh, so what you end up with is, um, again, a totally empty product with unbound molecules of fructose and glucose. And those unbound molecules are highly reactive. They turn into free radicals in the body. And those are these chemical compounds that attack our cells. They can even change the DNA, which then can lead to premature aging and can set the stage for cancer. Fructose also leads to higher levels of triglycerides, which is an independent risk factor for heart disease. But even more, um, when you eat foods that contain corn syrup, they manipulate your hunger mechanism. So normally, you know, you, when you feel hunger, it signals to you that it's time to eat. You eat something, and after a little while, your appetite will sort of lessen, and after a little while more, you come to a place where you realize, okay, I've had enough food, I'm satisfied. When you eat foods that have high fructose corn syrup in them, uh, your brain is tricked into thinking that I am still hungry. You never get to the point where you feel satisfied with your food, which easily then will lead to overeating and weight gain and everything that follows. Uh, it also literally programs your brain for an intense desire for overly sweet things. So again, it sets you up for a lifelong wanting of overly sweet things, which will lead to weight gain, to diabetes, obesity, and all these problems. So really important also for your children to really watch that they don't eat any or much of this corn syrup because children's brains are obviously much more impressionable. And um, the other bad news about uh, corn syrup is that it's made from genetically modified corn. And also in this complicated process of creating the syrup, mercury is used, which means traces of mercury end up in the corn syrup. And that has been linked to autism in children, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, dementia, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, heart failure, Parkinson's disease, and cancer in adults. Okay, moving on. One more bad news item and then we're moving on to more positive things. <laughs> uh, 
Now, a highly problematic drink that I would like to mention is soda, or as you call it, pop, right? You call it pop. So sodas or pops have several characteristics that make them detrimental to your health, and I wholeheartedly recommend avoiding them completely. They contain all kinds of chemicals and dyes, um, but they're also loaded with either sugar, corn syrup, or artificial sweeteners. And artificial sweeteners are nerve toxins, meaning damaging to your nervous system and brain, as well as carcinogenic, causing cancer. A can of soda can have as much as 13 teaspoons of sugar in it. Now, you would never sit down and eat 13 teaspoons of sugar in one sitting, would you? Wouldn't even cross your mind. But you drink that one can of soda, no problem, without realizing you know, what you really are ingesting. And both the carbonation and the phosphoric acid content in sodas leads to loss of calcium from your bones and teeth. I heard something interesting just this summer in Estonia where, you know, sodas haven't been around for that long as they have been here. And people are noticing now that children much more easily break their bones when they just fall playing ball or tripping, playing other games. So there can be a connection between, you know, the sodas and the, and the weak bones. And because carbonated drinks make you burp, <laughs> acid from the stomach will rise into your esophagus and damaging the cells in your esophagus sof and can set the stage for cancer there too. So please, please, please do not drink those pops. Okay, second principle, making proteins work for you. Foods that contain a high concentration of protein, such as meat, poultry, fish, or eggs, provide the body with tyrosine, an amino acid that elevates neurotransmitters that create a sense of stimulation, excitement, and assertiveness, which in turn can lead to keen attention, mental swiftness, fast reactions, heightened motivation, and facility in solving problems and overcoming challenges. So if you have an important meeting to attend or you need to make a presentation in front of an audience, have some of those protein foods for breakfast. That will set you up for a successful day. And if you're a vegan, I recommend you eat some quinoa because that is the only grain that has complete protein and also has the highest percentage of protein. Of course, you can do a combo of grain and legumes as well. Okay, so guess what I had before I came to this lecture? Any guesses? No, I didn't. I had two boiled eggs. Okay, uh, third principle, choosing healthy fats and oils. A diet rich in healthy fats is essential to clear thinking, good memory, and a balanced mood. Your brain is in fact made up of fat. So going low fat or no fat is not the way to go if you want your brain to work properly. Omega-3 fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids are the best brain food. But saturated fatty acids are okay. Omega-3, uh, threes are found in fatty cold water fish, like salmon, herring, and sardines, but also in walnuts and flax seeds, chia seeds, and hemp seeds. I'm going to expand on the topic of fats a little more, just like I did with the sugar, because there's a lot of confusion out there regarding fats and oils. Contrary to what many people fear, the most serious health problems caused by fats and oils 
are neither due to cholesterol or high calorie count. They are due to rancidity and unnatural processing of the oils. There are three different kinds of fatty acids, which are the building blocks of oils. And most oils and fats are a combination of all three of them, just at different ratios. And the three kinds of fatty acids are polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and saturated fatty acids. Omega-3 and 6 are both polyunsaturated fatty acids and they are very instable, which means they become rancid very easily, especially omega-3. An oil becomes rancid by exposure to heat, light, and oxygen. And you know what that means, like uh, rancid, right? It just simply means that the oil is spoiling and has gone bad. Now, omega-3 has anti-inflammatory and blood-thinning properties, while omega-6 can lead to inflammation and blood clotting. So you can see how these two types of uh, fatty acids need to be balanced in a food or in a oil. It's not a good idea to consume too many omega-6s without the balancing effect of the omega-3s. Makes sense, right? Now, many common vegetable oils um, have a ratio of omega-6 to 3 that is not good for us. They have way too much omega-6 and very little omega-3. So, soybean, corn, sunflower seed, grape seed, and safflower uh, oils have high amounts of omega-6 and small amounts of omega-3. So for that reason alone, they are not the best oils for consumption. But on top of that, if you look at these, I mean, okay, uh, the sunflower seeds, you, you can have a sense that they are oily, right? But uh, soybeans, corn, where's the oil there, right? So there's very little oil in them and it, it doesn't come out by just squeezing them. So you have to use heat, you have to have so use solvents to get the oil out of these foods. And we just learned that omega-6s and omega-3s are very unstable and go rancid very easily. So when you use heat to get the oil out of the thing, they already go rancid in the manufacturing process. And because rancid oils smell bad, they are then deodorized. And that's how rancid oils end up on our supermarket shelves. So all these yellow oils that are in the clear bottles are no good. And if you use them, you might have noticed they don't smell like anything. They all smell the same way, although they come from different foods, right? So um, stay, stay away from them because the, the, the deodorization will take away the smell, but it will not take away the rancidity. So you want to stay away from all these refined and processed oils. And um, it will not say this on the label. Unless it's specifically stated that an oil is unrefined, you may assume that it is refined and processed, and you do not want to buy those. So when it comes to choosing the right oil, you want to always buy the unrefined ones, the cold pressed ones, because that's the gentlest way of oil extraction, and it will not render the oil rancid. A great oil for use for most purposes in your kitchen is extra virgin or also called first cold pressed olive oil, which happens to be an oil that is high in monounsaturated fatty acids. It doesn't even have much of the omega-3s or 6s in it. 
And because it is high in monounsaturated fatty acids, it's also a fairly stable oil. So it can take medium temperatures in cooking. And it will not turn rancid. Now, common oils or fats that are high in saturated fatty acids are coconut oil, palm kernel oil, butter, and ghee. And ghee is clarified butter, which means it is pure milk fat. Whereas butter still has some lactose, some protein particles, and a little water in it. So these fats are very stable, and they are okay for high temperature cooking. So when you want to do some serious frying, use one of them. Butter is not so good for serious frying because you've probably noticed that yourself. If you heat up butter, it turns brown and then black. But that's not because of the oil in the butter or the fat in the butter. It's because of these particles, the lactose and the, and the protein, that this happens. So for that reason, butter is not great for frying, but ghee is because it is 100% fat. But then you can use butter just by, you know, adding it at the end of the cooking process over your vegetables or something. Um, so that works fine. Now, um, there might be some oils that have omega-6s and 3 in them that might be considered a healthy choice if they are unrefined and cold pressed. So these kinds of oils might be uh, walnut oil or um, pumpkin seed oil, flaxseed oil, hemp seed oil. But these oils you should never ever heat up. They should always be kept in the refrigerator and they should always be in dark bottles because they're extremely sensitive to even light. And those you should use only cold, like in a dressing or sprinkled on your ready-made food at the table. And before I end my talk about fats, I also want to tell you about, about hydrogenated uh, oils and trans fats. So in essence, these are both the same thing. You know, they're trying to confuse us by putting out these two expressions, but the um, hydrogenation uh, relates to the process, how they are being made, whereas trans fats then are the outcome of this process. And um, all hydrogenated oils contain trans fats, even if it says big on the front of the package, zero trans fats. That's just advertisement. You always have to look on the back and read that really fine print to know what's in your food. So let me tell you how margarine is made. So we start with those same cheapo supermarket oils that have already become rancid in the manufacturing process. Then as a next step, under big pressure and lots of heat, hydrogen gas is forced into those liquid oils. And uh, these oils are high in the um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which means they have in their molecular structure two or three or more double bonds. And so these are not long chains like the saturated fatty acids, but at the place of these double bonds, there's a kink in the, mo in the molecule. So there is a little, you know, thing like this. And so the hydrogen now comes and does a little trick and turns the oil this way so that you do get this long line. And this is why a liquid oil becomes a semi-solid mass at room temperature. Because, because all the fats that contain the saturated fatty acids are semi-solid, like butter, like coconut oil is never liquid, right? It's, it's, it's semi-solid. So then, out of this machine, comes a gray, ill-smelling mass. This needs to be, again, deodorized with some chemicals, and then it needs to be bleached with some chemicals, and then they add a little bit of yellow dye to make it look more butter-like. So that's margarine for you. So I hope you consider not buying margarine anymore, 
But if you really want to avoid uh, hydrogenated fats, you would have to stay away from all commercially produced baked goods because they're all made with margarine because it's cheap and it doesn't go bad because, because it's already very bad. Now, there are several health problems associated with trans fats. The enzyme that normally breaks down fats in the body is ineffective with the trans fats because the mole molecule of trans fats really resembles more plastic than oil or fat. And so it's very difficult for our body to metabolize those trans fats. And that means that they circle, circle in our bloodstream much longer than any other fatty acid. So they are much more prone for plaque formation. So they also can easily contribute to heart disease. Other diseases associated with trans fats are Alzheimer's disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, liver dysfunction, and infertility in women. Okay, fourth principle. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Is hydrating the body. Coffee and other caffeinated beverages, such as cola drinks, have a dehydrating effect on the body. When it comes to proper hydration, water is really the best beverage for keeping your body and brain running smoothly. Water is vital to energy production in our cells, and without it, our nerve transmission is compromised as well, meaning our mental capacity is diminished. So typically, when you experience an energy dip in the afternoon, it most likely is a sign of dehydration. And having coffee at that time then will actually exasperate the situation rather than relieve it. So I invite you to experiment next time when that happens and you feel that dip in energy in the afternoon, have a glass or two of water first and then check in with your body whether you still need that coffee or that sweet treat. And I'd say 99% of the time, the water will wash away any tiredness and any cravings for sugar. Fifth principle, loading up on the antioxidants. Antioxidants increase cognitive function and protect our cells and keep them youthful and youthful. Interestingly, most antioxidants are pigments of color. So food rich in antioxidants include berries, leafy greens, all strong colored vegetables, nuts, seeds, and cacao, the ingredient that makes chocolate chocolate. And you'll be happy to know that cacao has the highest antioxidant content of any food on this planet. So, of course, you want to go for the dark chocolate to get more of the good stuff, right? And uh, again, you have to look at the fine print because it is legal to call a chocolate dark chocolate if there is at least 41% cacao in it. And that's a joke, right? I mean, it's less than half. So, really, you want to go for the 70% and up so then you know that you know, you've got 70% good stuff and then 30% only bad stuff. Garlic, too, is a great source of antioxidants. The fresher, the better. It is also fabulous for reducing cholesterol and strengthening your cardiovascular system. Now, tomatoes contain a certain antioxidant called lycopene. And that is particularly good for your brain. It's, it's said to help prevent even dementia. However, you have to cook your tomatoes to get the benefit of that antioxidant. It's also said to prevent prostate cancer and improves your skin's ability to protect itself against UV rays. Sixth principle, ensuring effective absorption of nutrients. So let's look at some eating habits or the lack thereof you might have fallen into 
that really do not serve you if you want to have clarity of mind, mental swiftness, and decision-making power. One purpose of eating is to provide your body with all the nutrients it needs to fulfill its manifold tasks of keeping you alive and well and performing at top level. But just as important as what we eat is how we eat. In order to get the most out of your food, it is best to eat while relaxed, unoccupied with intense mental activity, and ideally in a pleasant environment. And one simple thing you can do to relax is to take a few deep breaths before you start eating. Do you find yourself eating while working at your desk? Anybody? Show me some hands. I know they're out there. Okay. <laughs> so just intuitively, what, what do you think? Um, how would that affect the efficiency of your nutrient absorption? Any thoughts? Go down? Yeah, that's right. I'm going to uh, tell you about a very interesting experiment that was done. So there was a group of people and they were all in a very relaxed, mellow state of mind and they were giving a mineral drink to drink. And then after 20 minutes, they were measured for the absorption of those minerals and turned out they absorbed them 100%, which is wonderful. Then next, they were given headphones and they were asked to listen to the audio in those headphones. On one ear, they were listening to somebody talk about intergalactic travel. And on the other ear, somebody was talking about the benefits of financial planning. <laughs> so trying to keep up with both of these um, conversations, they were given that mineral drink. And 20 minutes later, they were measured. And it turned out they absorbed 0%. Yes, so that's kind of amazing, right? So by working while eating and not paying attention to what you eat, your brain, well, because your brain is busy doing other tax, tasks, it really proves that it's detrimental to your digestive process, including the breakdown of your food, the absorption and the assimilation of nutrients. And the reason is, that digestion really starts in the brain. Your brain needs to register what kind of food you're eating, how it smells, how it tastes, what it looks like, what the texture of the food feels like, in order to then inform your digestive system what it needs to do in order to digest the food, what kind of acids, enzymes, and hormones it needs to produce. So if you bypass this head phase of digestion, you're not doing yourself any nutritional favors. And one other thing that happens in the head, or more specifically in the mouth, is the action of chewing. Your mouth is the only place in the digestive system where your food is ground mechanically into smaller pieces. And it makes all the sense in the world that well-chewed food is much better prepared for digestion and nutrient absorption. And if you chew well, it will also meal that mean that you will not feel tired after eating because your digestive system is pulling all bodily resources into your belly in order to digest your food and you will absorb your nutrients with ease. There's a Buddhist saying that says, um, let's see if I do this right, chew your drink and drink your food. Meaning you can even chew your drinks and you should chew your food until it becomes liquid so that you can drink it. So give it a try. Okay, I'm pretty much coming to the end of my little talk and I'm going to um, sum up the most important points. 
the seven principles of energizing body and mind. One, be choosy with your carbohydrates. Go for vegetables, cooked intact whole grains and legumes. Reduce sugary sweets, white flour products, and foods and drinks containing corn syrup. Two, make proteins work for you. For keen attention, mental swiftness, and heightened motivation, choose meat, poultry, fish, or eggs, or quinoa if you're a vegan. Three, feed your brain healthy fats from cold water fish, nuts, seeds, and avocados, as well as unrefined cold pressed oils like olive oil, coconut oil, pumpkin seed oil, and flaxseed oil. The latter two only use cold and avoid hydrogenated oils altogether. Four, hydrate your body with plenty of fresh water. Five, Go for strong colors on your plate to load up on anti-aging and cell-protecting antioxidants. Six, to ensure effective absorption of nutrients, be fully present when eating and chew well. And seven, apply the 80-20 rule. We haven't talked about that yet, so I'm gonna explain. Even if you figured out for yourself the best way of feeding yourself, the most beautiful food philosophy that works like a charm for you. If you try to do this 100% correct all the time, it's gonna feel restrictive psychologically. And very soon you're not gonna like this anymore and then you're gonna forget about it and then you're gonna forget about it altogether, which would be such a shame. So instead, I'm suggesting try to eat wisely 80% of the time. And then 20% of the time, you know, life happens and you go with the flow and you eat whatever, it's not gonna kill you. We are just human, we are not perfect. That's what makes us so charming. And therefore, we shouldn't be asked to be perfect either. So we need a little wiggle room, we need a little room for play, a little room for being naughty. So don't worry about that. And when you do, enjoy it, okay? All right. That's it. <laughs> Now, don't we all just feel healthy and we're never <laughs> eating a bad thing again except for 20% of the time. <laughs> uh, Marika, are you willing to answer some questions? Yuck. Marika, I uh -huh. have this presentation. I'm away. All right, thank I'm you. Really Okay, Canada, yes, yes, very good question. So maple syrup is one of those natural sweeteners that is totally okay. Okay, of course you don't wanna overdo it either because it is a concentrated source of sugar, but in the case of maple syrup, right, it's also a concentrated source of minerals because you know it's from the sap of the tree, the tree pulls all the minerals from deep, deep, in the earth up into the trunk. And so you boil it down, right? So you end up con with concentrated sugar and concentrated minerals. And therefore it's not an empty food and therefore it does not affect our body as drastically as white sugar. So that's a good idea, you know, to switch from white sugar to maple syrup or you, you can use honey or there are a few other natural products like uh, brown rice syrup and barley malt. I do not recommend agave nectar anymore because although the process is natural, it's, it also contains a lot of fructose, which at first seemed like a great thing because it doesn't affect your blood sugar level as drastically as would glucose. 
and it was even recommended for diabetics in moderation. But now with all this research coming out about the corn syrup and all the, the about the fructose, it turns out it's, it's not such a good idea because it too will lead to this kind of, uh, you know, hunger thing and uh, not being satisfied with your food. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If you categorize, and obviously in moderation. Absolutely. Um, beer, wine, alcohol. Well, you know, you know about r red wine, right? It's highest in antioxidants, so that would probably be the most healthful alcoholic beverage. But again, really everything in moderation. I think it's fine to have your vodka and fine to have your beer too. Yeah. You're welcome. Sorry, but you never did mention cold-pressed olive oil. Of course I did. I don't recall. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everybody else heard it. Yeah. I would like to ask about uh, canola, organic canola oil. That's what I've been using there because if you need to heat it up, it doesn't burn or... Okay, so canola oil is made from rapeseed. Right, and rapeseed oil is also high in monounsaturated fatty acids, similarly as olive oil. So in that that sense, it is a is a good oil. It's fairly stable. You can use it for cooking. You just want to make sure it's also cold pressed. Yes. Yeah. And my other question is a wonderful question. It is it's a margarine. It is recommended to keep in the our hot water. Doctors still recommend margarine. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but uh, no, okay. totally not. Okay. Thank you. Peanut oil, yes. Also another sam uh, example of high monosaturated, so yes, it's, it's okay too. You know, I have really not looked for that. Uh, I would guess, if at all, in the health food store, yeah. Uh, what about the so-called raw sugar, turbinado sugar? Uh? Yes, if it's really raw, uh, if, it's, if it's dehydrated cane juice, then that's okay too. So uh, that's the only product of all the cane sugar products that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Brown sugar is not better than white sugar because it's basically 99% white sugar with a little molasses coating on the uh, crystal. And of course, molasses is a great thing, you know, uh, especially blackstrap molasses. Um, and that's a beautiful visual where you have this almost black thing and then you have this white thing. The, they both come from the same plant. And in the white thing, you have nothing but the sugar. And in the black thing, you have all the minerals. It's really high in iron and magnesium and calcium. And so it's almost like take a spoonful and get your minerals that way. Monica, yeah. I don't know if you, oh, I'm not sure if you mentioned honey. Yes, I did. Okay, it's a vitamin rich. Yes, it's high yes. also yeah. in minerals and has some enzymes. And with honey, you also don't really want to heat it. So even not put it in hot tea. If you just want the sweet taste, it's, it's of course okay, it's fine, but you lose the enzymes and you lose the medicinal quality of honey. But for oh. sweetener, it works, sure. Can I also ask about sesame oil, which is something Chinese food uses? Yeah, sesame is sort of borderline. Um, it is, um, it's right between the sort of fairly stable and the unstable oils. So I know it's widely used and also for cooking, but definitely don't use roasted or toasted sesame oil for cooking. That's really only meant for flavoring food at the end of the process, cooking process. Oh, sorry. Uh, so pasteurized honey is not a good idea? No, 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 no. <laughs> Just wanted to confirm. <laughs> uh, you didn't talk about the um, milk industry. No. <laughs> We got some milk people here. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I mean, milk is a controversial um, subject, and many people really don't tolerate milk too well. Many people lose 
their ability to produce lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down lactose, the milk sugar, at age four. So for me, that points towards um, maybe the idea that milk is meant for little people, not for adults. Uh, I would say that definitely, as an adult, you do not need to consume milk or milk products to thrive. You can do fine without it. Um, however, there are beautiful things that can be done with milk, uh, and uh, especially the cultured milk products. Uh, they are much better for your digestive tract. They provide you with the friendly bacteria, and for example, kefir is like 99% lactose-free. So that's much better to tolerate for everybody. And um, if uh, you enjoy plain milk, then of course raw milk would be the best, uh, which comes straight from the cow and is just chilled. The next level then is pasteurized and then homogenized, which homo homo homogenization means that they take the fat molecules and split them so that they will float in the milk as opposed to rise to the top. So if you've ever gotten milk from the farmer, you know that the cream rises to the top and that's totally normal. So the more the, the milk is processed, you know, the, 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 you know the, the less it is valuable. And the thing with pasteurization is, I mean, people are afraid, the government is afraid that, you know, milk has bacteria, you might get sick and all of that. But together with the pasteurization, of course, all the enzymes in the milk get killed too, which help, <laughs> again, to digest the milk. So it's, it's kind of a crazy situation. I mean, it's illegal. Uh, I know, I heard that also in Canada, but in the States, to, to have raw milk. And, um, and then for some people, uh, they can tolerate goat milk better than cow's milk. Uh, and goat milk, it's interesting because uh, it actually has a higher percentage of fat than, than uh, cow's milk, but the fat molecules are smaller, so they are also better for our digestive tract. And the, and the goat, if you look at the animal, is more the size of a person than a cow, right? So, I mean, in essence, we're drinking, you know, the milk that's meant for little calves to grow into huge cows. So we don't necessarily want to do that, right? And the other thing, you know, the, it's the milk uh, industry, they push the milk on us because of calcium, calcium, calcium. But of course, there are many other food sources of calcium. And where do you think the cow gets the calcium from? The grass, right? So eat green things and you get plenty of calcium. You can cut out the middleman. I've just got a quick other question, yeah. and that's about well. antioxidants and sauerkraut. I heard that it has more than any other uh, thing you can possibly eat, and uh, it's better for you than cabbage. Well, um, um, yes, um, fermented uh, food is the only, or fermentation, let's say, is the only process that you do to food that actually enhances their nutrient content. So yes, sauerkraut or pickles or whatever you do, uh, lacto-fermented uh, is excellent. And I would recommend everybody to eat something lacto-fermented every day uh, because it is a live food. It has live enzymes. It gives you those friendly bacteria. So it's overall a very good thing, yes. So it's better to be done rather than brined. That's what it means. Lacto-fermented means that it's brined. And if you are not sure, you look at the label. So even pickles, you know, if there's vinegar in it, that's a different process. That's marinating. But if there's only salt in it and maybe some, you know, like um, garlic or whatever, you know, for taste, then that's the right thing. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. What about the sweetness of eating both? Is it sweet for salad for sure? Or is it after? <laughs> Well, um, I mean, generally, fruit is eaten best, best on its own. So that's why fruit is kind of an ideal snack food, if you must snack. Uh, because fruits digest the fastest. So it's better that you just eat them, and they move through, and that's good. 
So if you eat f fruit after a meal, then the, the fruit kind of sits on the rest of the meal and has to wait until that gets digested and then it starts fermenting and that might not be so good. Some people are more, s more sensitive to this than others. Uh, but otherwise, I would say eat, you know, if, if, if you're asking about a salad, it makes sense to eat the salad first. It has enzymes, fresh food, and then eat the other food after that. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh yeah, okay, stevia. Stevia is another sweetener, and um, that is made from a plant called the honey leaf plant. And um, it's an interesting product because the thing that's sweet in stevia is not a sugar at all, which means that it does not affect our blood sugar level at all. So that's the ideal sweetener for people who are diabetic. It's called stevia, yes, and you can buy it as a powder, you can buy it as a, as a tincture. And it's very intense sweet. So you need just a little drop to sweeten things. So it doesn't work so well in baking because you don't add any volume to your dough. So the recipe might not work. Uh, but to sweeten, you know, a drink or some other kinds of desserts, uh, it works really well. Yeah. Marika? Mm -hmm. Can you say or maybe uh, talk a little bit more about uh, how this beautiful book came about? Oh, Did sure. Did you enjoy <laughs> the writing process and do you have any other ideas for your next book? Okay, yeah. Um, actually, I did enjoy that whole process. And uh, the way the book came about was that, um, you know, at Politalu we feed our guests well and they always... Um, uh, love the food and they always ask me, so when are you going to write your cookbook? And I've always thought, oh well, one of these years and I'm sure it's going to be very work intensive and I'm sure it's going to be very expensive, which now speaking from experience, I can say that it is indeed so. But um, in uh, 2007, I was doing my week-long wellness retreat and my niece was taking part in that. And again, the question arose, so when are you gonna write your cookbook? And then my niece looked at me and said, well, let's do it. And I said, well, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and so she became the producer for the book and I was the writer and the artistic director. And, um, and my first idea was actually to write a bilingual book, to have both Estonian and English in one book. And the first thing we really did was we took all the pictures for the recipes. And I knew this had to be a book that would be beautiful and there had to be a picture with each recipe because I don't below, b believe in cookbooks that have only text and no pictures. You know, you need to be inspired, uh, you know, to cook. And, um, and uh, so one of the hopes that I have for my book is really that it will seduce you to start cooking more and start cooking healthier foods. And, um, and then in the winter I finished the writing and I wrote it in English actually because my Estonian is not that good to be really able to write a book. And uh, then it was translated into Estonian and we started then to, I worked very closely with the designer, uh, practically, you know, I can say that the book is 90% designed by me and 10% by the designer. And um, so I didn't expect all this workload, really. I thought, <laughs> you know, the designer will do their job and the editor will do their job and the translator will do their job, but you have to absolutely check everybody. Everybody makes so many mistakes, it's unbelievable. Like the person who translated it, I mean, she knows I speak Estonian, right? And she knows she can ask me, like if she translates something and that doesn't make any logical sense, wouldn't you like double check? No. So we spent hours and hours and hours and, and I can't even imagine all these translated books, you know, they're just full of mistakes, I'm sure especially if the author doesn't speak that language. I mean, luckily, I, I speak Estonian to, to find the mistakes. Anyway, um, 
But so I, I truly did enjoy that whole process, especially the designing of it. And, you know, just looking at it and I'll move this this way, move this this way, no, let's take this photo instead. And and so I, I, I truly enjoyed that part. And and for some re reason, it came totally natural to me. I mean, it, I didn't feel like I'm doing this for the first time. I just was totally in charge. It was great. <laughs> and... Um, and then, yes, yeah, we started to put things into book format. All of a sudden, we ended up with page 300. And then I thought, oh my God, adding another language to that, you know, that would just make the book too voluminous. I mean, it's thick enough as it is. And so we decided kind of very late in the process to do Estonian first and then English later. And that, that was a good thing. Uh, I'm really glad we did it this way. And... Um, and then the English one came out two years later, and now I'm thinking of working on a second one. And I've already, uh, you know, made the schedule when we're going to do the photography this summer again at the farm, and then in the winter I'm going to write it. So it's going to be, you know, more whole foods recipes, and um, there's going to be the nutrition chapters in the beginning too. I'm still thinking exactly what to do, but I want to talk more about uh, bone health and thyroid health and more about lifestyle, you know, incorporating meditation into your life, incorporating... I think I'm going to put some simple yoga exercises into it too. Um, I had a whole long list of things I forgot now what exactly, but I have lots of plans, yeah, for the second book. And so the schedule will be again that it would come out then in 2014 in, in the fall. So a year and a half later. Okay, last. All right, we're going to do two more questions then. Uh, I'm going to backtrack again. Mm -hmm. um, lard in its natural form. Lard. Lard. Mm -hmm. And grape seed oil with a G. Yeah, okay, lard is totally fine. It's a saturated fat, very stable, and can be used also for heavy-duty frying. And um, what was the second question? <laughs> grapeseed oil. Okay, grapeseed oil, again, is one of those oils that's um, high in omega-6 versus omega-3, so not so great, and most of it is refined, so not so great. Um, I was just wondering, kind of following on what you were saying about the lifestyle and, and meditation that you're going to put more of in your next book, um, just wondering if you have a few thoughts to, actually it's kind of an appropriate time of day to, just thoughts on um, sort of winding down at the end of a day and preparing yourself for better sleep, because I know sleep is a huge part of digestion and health and recharging yeah. and that kind of thing as well. Yeah, okay, so... Uh, one thing that helps is to have dinner on the earlier side. Uh, you definitely want to have at least three hours before you end dinner and you go to bed. The thing is that our metabolism is really totally connected to the sun. So when the sun is at its highest, our metabolism too is at its high point, which means at noon, right? So... Ideally, that is actually the time to have your biggest meal because then you, your digestive fire is stronger and you will be also burning your calories more effectively. So as the evening comes, our metabolism actually slows down in preparation for sleep. So that's why you also don't want to have a heavy meal at nighttime because it's going to be hard for you to digest. And it's going to be more likely that you will put on some weight uh, if you have the heavy meal in the evening versus in at midday. So you want to kind of get into this natural rhythm with your body. So allowing it to slow down and it's okay, right? You want to go to bed. Um, you want to also go to bed early, kind of early, maybe around 10 o'clock, latest 11 o'clock, because... Um, as a natural cycle, our liver kicks into high gear around 11 o'clock. And it, that's kind of another sort of hot time. And that's why all nightclubs open at 11, because we get that second wind. Uh, but ideally, you want to be resting when your liver is doing its very important job of 
uh, filtering the blood and cleansing your body. So if you are up late all the time, then your liver cannot do its job properly, which means you will not sleep well, you will wake up sluggish and not feeling refreshed. So that's sort of about the biorhythm that the body goes through. And um, so other things that you can do to kind of get ready for sleep is really not to do anything exciting anymore, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like an hour before you go to bed, you know, read a boring book or listen to some relaxing music or, you know, things like that. Take a bath. Did that answer your question a little? Yeah. And it's nice to kind of have a ritual, you know, that your body already knows, okay, now I'm going into this stage and soon I'm going to go to bed. Yeah. And actually, Kaya, what this is? These are zucchini flowers. And uh, I know the Italians, they dip them in dough and then they fry them, which I don't like so much. So I thought, why dip them in dough? And so I just saute them uh, with garlic just as they are, and it's really delicious. But Kaya, uh, let me say one more thing, okay? <laughs> I didn't get to talk about my wellness retreat, which I highly recommend. And out there are flyers if you want to pick one up. And this is probably the most well-rounded retreat that I do at my farm every summer in August. And it's a week long. And what we do is we do some yoga in the morning. Then before lunch, we get together and we have a cooking class. So each lunch, we make a three-course meal, including dessert. And then in the afternoon, I do a lecture. Uh, we'll do some uh, breath walking, walking with conscious breathing. And before we go to bed, we do a meditation. And in this week, everybody gets two massages or Reiki treatments, you can choose. And um, we one day we'll do a beautiful outing into the nature surrounding Politalo. So we'll be you know, spending all day out there hiking and picnicking. And um, it's really amazing what happens when you do this for a week. I mean, people transform visibly. They arrive at Politalu, they're all worn out and bored to death and fed up with, you know, day-to-day -day life. And they just completely, first of all, they finally get to rest. We all need to rest more than we think. Then they get to eat this wonderful food, which is not empty but full of nutrients. They will lose some weight while they're eating like delicious food and are not hungry ever and um, they just start glowing I mean they just start blossoming, bloss blossoming. so by the time they leave my farm they're all rejuvenated and, and uh, have all this energy and feel harmonious and balanced and grounded and it's a wonderful thing so I highly recommend that <laughs> Oh, very we'll sweet. Bring you to your hotel. Okay, for a thank time you. That you're there, but at least you'll get to, you know, appreciate a little bit. Yes. Aita Marika. Aita. And uh, you still have a chance to see more of Marika and taste some of her delicious things on Saturday if you jump at it quickly. <laughs> thank you very much.